Welcome to the Earning Freedom Podcast. I am Michael Santos with michaelsantos.com and prisonprofessor.com. I'm always striving to provide some insight that will help individuals who are encountering the criminal justice system, regardless of whether the stage they're at is at the beginning of the stage or the end of the stage. And today I have the privilege of, st- of speaking with Scott Clark. I know that Scott is going to have an interesting story about his journey through the criminal justice system. And I hope that I'll be able to respond to any questions he has about how to make the most effective use of this journey ahead. So Scott, welcome to Earning Freedom. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, as uh, Mike said, I'm Scott Clark. I'm 63 years old. I live in northern Utah. Uh, However, I uh, grew up in Utah, uh, got my bachelor's degree at Utah State University, and then I went to work outside of Utah for about 25 years, mostly in California. T- tell us what your, what your undergraduate degree was in, Scott. I have an undergraduate degree in finance and accounting, and then I have an MBA from the University of Arkansas. Wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. And how did you build your career? Well, <laughs> I uh, started out working for an accounting firm in California in, in 1978 and 79, then decided that I didn't want to be a CPA. And uh, so I decided that I would uh, go to graduate school. So I applied and was accepted at the University of Arkansas. So I went there from 1980 to 1982. And then I went to work for a uh, large corporation, Arkansas Best Corporation, for a couple of years. And then I went to work for a large company in California as a controller for about 11 years. Then I went out on my own after that. And uh-huh. uh, kind I've of been on my own since then. Okay, okay, great. And so what, what types of challenges, or when did you learn that the uh, federal government became interested in your, uh, in your activities? Well, I, I guess I could say that I, uh, when I started my own businesses, I needed capital. And in raising that capital, I did not, uh, you know, understand the, the uh, the laws regarding raising capital, so I evaluated some securities uh, transactions. I should, you know, I didn't have the proper licensing when I started raising the capital. I didn't know that I would raise from very many people, but as it turned out, I needed more and more capital. So, uh, you know, the number of people that I raised capital from increased, and in doing that, I should have got better legal counsel and find and found out exactly what was required in raising capital. That was so. You know, that- I can tell you that I've met a lot of individuals who've found themselves targeted by uh, prosecutors in the criminal justice system, not because they started out with an intention of committing a crime, but for the very reasons that you just described, not really understanding how decisions they are making can bring them into the crosshairs of the criminal justice system. And in your case, my understanding is it's because of the way that you went about raising capital. What was the first altercation you had or the first notice you had that there might be um, some problems with the criminal justice system? Well, the first notice, you know, is <laughs> I started uh, receiving indications from people that were my investors indicating that the FBI was wanting to talk to them regarding, you know, uh, how I'd raised capital from them. And they were my friends. i in fact, all the people that I raised funds from were generally family and friends and people that I knew pretty closely. So, of course, when the FBI contacted them, I was their first call after that. And letting and they let me know, you know, hey, the FBI is wanting to find out some things about the capital that, I, that I've given to you. And when you learned that the FBI were at, was asking questions, what was your next step? Well, of course, you get the fear, you know, knowing the FBI is investigating. And so, uh, you know, my next step was to uh, to check in. Talk, you know, I talked to my attorney and asked, you know, some questions of him regarding what I had been doing. And he was somewhat displeased with me because I had not uh, consulted with him on a lot of this stuff that I was doing because I really didn't know that I was uh, crossing the line. I should have known. First of all, because you know I have a good education, I had a lot of experience at the time, so I probably should have known that I needed to have more paperwork and 
you know, I needed to have a, a section seven or a license and some of those kind of things probably should have known that. But, uh, you know, like you mentioned at the beginning, you don't realize that you're going to, you know, come in the crosshairs of the FBI or the SEC. And so, and I was only going to raise a smaller amount of money and, and then it got to be larger and larger. And so the number of people went from a few to quite a few. That's, that is generally the case. You know, things get started with, with an idea of trying to provide a service, but, but uh, when, it get, when it spins out of control, we find that, uh, you know, we can get ourselves into some deep water. As you look back right now, is there anything that you would have liked to have done differently, not from the time that you learned the FBI was interested in you? Uh, yeah, I, I probably would have done a number of things different. First of all, I probably would have, uh, you know, I probably, sh when I found out the FBI was interested in me, I, shot, I probably should have contacted them or contacted the SEC and, and started asking questions of them about, you know, why are you doing this? Have I violated any laws? Are there things that I'm not aware of that I've done that are not correct? I probably should have taken more, more of a proactive approach to that. But I did it. And, uh, you know, and, and then you always kind of think, well, you know, these are my friends. They, most of them gave me money without any documentation, <laughs> okay, without any documentation at all. And so, uh, you know, I should have just known better, and, but I didn't. And uh, so it was, I was a pretty easy target for the uh, SEC because I'd violated the law pretty, you know, it was pretty easy to and when was it that you initially got contacted? Well, I guess I was initially contacted in about January of this year. sometime January of 2016. Yeah. So it was a rather rapid, rapid series of events. If you just got contacted in January, what, what proceeded there, thereafter? Well, you know, in my case, I'm 63 years old. And so... <laughs> You know, I didn't want to spend a long time fighting this because I didn't have the resources to, to do so. I had a really good attorney who gave me some, I think, some good advice and about, well, you know, I don't think we can win if we do this. It'll cost two to 500000 to fight the situation. So, you know, he recommended that I go ahead and enter into a plea agreement, which they were interested in doing, okay? And so... And so at that point, we just started working with the uh, U.S. attorney and the FBI and uh, reached a plea agreement. At that point, I decided that I didn't want to wait around. But most importantly, I, you know, I, uh, during this period of time, I met Justin. And Justin actually was a real life sin to me. Because our listeners are not going to know what that means, you met Justin. Okay. Tell me what you met when you say you just you met Justin, how did that happen? And tell us a little bit about why you would have met Justin. That's great. I'm glad you asked me that. You know, when you're going through this, there's an, an immense amount of, of suffering and pain that you're going through. Uh, just, just simply at my age, knowing that you're in the crosshairs of the FBI or the SEC, you know that it's not an easy deal. There's going to be embarrassment and pain for your family. I have children and and uh, brothers and sisters and people that I love very much and who love me a lot, okay? And so I was going through an immense amount of suffering, realizing, you know, what's going to happen. I, I realized I was going to have a prison sentence, okay, because that's what we were negotiating. And so, you know, I was just struggling with this. And so, of course, one of the things I did was I went online and, uh, and I found Justin Paperni's name and I found his book. And I sat down and read his book all one night. <laughs> okay. And, and that book is, which book was that? I think it's what, Life in Prison or something. The first Lessons book. from Prison by Best. Justin Paperni. And so you found the book. You were able to get the book. You read it in a night. Tell me a little more. After I read the book, I, I exercised every day. And so I was up in the place I exercised and, you know, feeling pretty damn bad, to be honest with you. But I, from reading the book, I thought, well, I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> so I found a phone number, and I called him. And I call it fade or call it whatever, but all of a sudden, he was on the other line. And, 
And at the time that I talked to him, he provided me with some insight about, you know, what was going to happen to me that I'd never heard before. He kind of made it sound like it wasn't, you know, that I was going to live, <laughs> that I could, you know, tell my heart to beat again, that I could breathe. And he gave me hope that, you know, hey, <laughs> you're still going to have a life. You know, yeah, you're going to have some difficulty and you're going to go through this, through this uh, camp experience and it's not going to be particularly enjoyable. But he gave me hope that I can still be productive and that I can still accomplish a great deal in my life. And to me, that was you know, really you know, important. I just want to say something that what you're describing is really the pattern of so many people when they are first targeted with this fear of the unknown. You don't know what prison's going to be. You're afraid, and that is exactly what you need, is the hope that you received from Justin Paperni. Somebody has gone through it. There's an old Chinese proverb. It says, if you want to know the road ahead, ask somebody who's already come back. And that's the advice that, that, that you can receive from a guy like Justin Paperni, somebody who's gone through the program. So you guys started having these conversations. What else did you guys do in, in your work together in preparing for this journey? Well, you know, he gave me an additional book that, he, that he'd written, Ethics in Motion. I read that and found that, uh, you know, a lot of things <laughs> correlated between that book and, you know, the things about my life as well. And I realized that, you know, hey, uh, going to camp could be a productive experience, okay? And I've generally been a hard worker in my life, so I've always – you know, been willing to take on new challenges and accept hard things. And, and it's really what I needed at the time to, uh, to make it through. Now, I have some terrific friends. I got to tell you that although Justin was, is my mentor in this, I had a lot of friends who I leaned upon for advice and for solace. And, you know, and, and they were amazing to me. I have uh, my brother and my sister and, you know, one daughter particularly and just some terrific friends who also helped with the process. But the fact is, is that he gave me hope, not only in the next two months before I surrender, but also hope that there's something after, that there's something that I can look forward to after this experience. I can be a productive citizen again. And uh, that was, uh, you know, really what I needed at the time. And then he, and, and, so I talked to him a great deal about, you know, what's going to happen in there, which is fearful. You know, you just have no idea what to expect. And uh, so he could tell me from the first day through the entire experience what I was going to go through and what I could expect and not expect. And he got me on a program of writing blogs and, and made me do some introspection on, you know, how I felt about things. And I set some goals for my time in in the correctional facility and you know I'm, I'm preparing to live a uh, productive life I, I don't think it's over for me so let me of course it's not over that we're we're all on a journey here and every day we can sow seeds for a better outcome but i'm going to ask you a couple of other questions first of all when you contacted justin at what stage in the journey were you had you already pleaded guilty or were you still in that contemplative stage when you're working out the judicial process? I was, uh, I had not pled guilty yet. I, I, we'd worked out a plea agreement when I talked to him and I was uh, like one week away or 10 days away from my sentencing hearing with the uh, judge. So I was getting close to the, to uh, my sentencing date. And, had you uh, done your investigation yet? Yes, we ha I had. I'd completed that. I went over it with Justin because Justin had the fear that, you know, a lot of attorneys and people don't do a very good job with that. So he and I went through that and but we came. Attorneys don't do a very good job with what, Scott? Prepar preparing you for that statement. You know, they don't and take enough. And did you enough... find that to be accurate or did you have good preparation before you did your pre-sentence investigation? I had some preparation. My attorney, I have a really good attorney. So I'm really lucky. I had a good attorney. And so we had gone through a lot of that together. But Justin helped me to formulate some changes and stuff that we made on that that were important as well. So I'm really, I'm really glad that I met Justin prior to some, the final submission. Can you that. tell us some of the changes that he recommended you make? 
Uh, some changes regarding, you know, some of the wording in my plea agreement. Uh, you know, some he one thing he did was and inspired me and got me to get some references. <laughs> okay, so I went out and got five or six people to write letters to the judges, and and those letters were in the the agreement, and uh, so that was really important to me. And up to that point, I. I think my attorney had told me that was important, but I didn't really understand the significance and where those letters would be in regard to that agreement. So that was really important as well. And then you had to go for the sentencing hearing. Tell us a little bit about what type of preparations you had for the sentencing hearing. Well, again, you know, Justin told me kind of what it was going to be like. Also, my attorney uh, had given me some good instructions. Uh, it was actually worse than I expected. Uh, you know, what were you expecting? How was it worse? Well, I wasn't expecting to receive the lecture that I received from the judge. I felt, I felt that he was kind of grandstanding a little bit. My family was all there. And, you know, I think he made some comments that were totally unrelated to my case. They were probably good general comments, but it was obvious that he didn't know what was going on. And so he made some comments, uh, you know, that, that I didn't think were particularly fair in my case. But, I mean, what can you say? He's a federal judge. And uh, so, you know, I wasn't really kind of prepared for that. I, I wish I maybe would have been. I don't know why I expected something different. I, but did, anyway. did Justin in any way talk with you about what you could expect at the sentencing hearing? Did you and Justin work through that process at all? Yeah, we did. We talked about it. He told me that, you know, that the judge would make some statements. And and, you know, we had a plea agreement that the, uh, you know, the U.S. attorney had agreed with my attorney. But the judge, of course, can decide whatever he wants. He doesn't have to follow the plea agreement. And, you know, there was a time during, the, during his lecture to me that I wondered if he was going to. But, you know, near the end, he acquiesced. And he did say a few positive things about me and the things that I've done in my life. And, uh, and, and did accept the plea agreement. And uh, that was kind of what we wanted. And my attorney said, just, just let it run off your back. You know, he, we got done what we wanted to do. Let's move on. And, and, and what it, was the sentence that the judge imposed? I was sentenced to 36 months in a federal prison camp. Uh, I was given the opportunity to self-surrender. Then I was giving, given three years of probation. And did you have a monetary uh, sanction attached to that sentence as well? Uh, just a restitution amount as well. And okay. how is that restitution going to influence your life? Well, I think it'll have a, a pretty direct influence financially because, you know, every cent that I earn in the future, part of it will be, you know, applied towards a restitution agreement. But I'm okay with that, actually. What uh, is the amount of restitution, if I may ask? It's... Well, it's 1.8 million, but there are a number of, there are going to be a number of other uh, people that share in that probably. So yeah, but a sizable amount. So, so you've, you, you're, you received the sentence that you anticipated, 36 months. You have a restitution order that's going to be divided among several other defendants. And now you come to the point of preparing during this this transitional period from the time that you're sentenced until the time that you surrender. Tell us a little bit about how you've been working to prepare yourself and what influences have been helping you along the way. Well, you know, I, I, I had Justin and, and, and a few other people that I, that I know who have gone to prison camp that he introduced me to. And they have given me a pretty good uh, idea about the day-to-day -day things that are going to happen in prison. And, and that's great. That's, that's okay. That's terrific. But the thing that, I'm re, that I've been really excited about is, uh, you know, the blogging and sharing my message. I'm really excited about helping others. Uh, I, I think I have something to say. I've lived a long time, so I have some real experience. And, and I think people out there are looking to listen and learn from people who have experience rather than just academicians or somebody who uh, has learned the story. We've not only learned the story, but we've gone through it. So we felt the joy and the pain and the, 
you know, the satisfaction and the failure. And so I think there's something to be said about, you know, learning from someone who's gone through that experience. So I'm excited about, about that possibility. Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, it's a new chapter in my life. You know, I, I think early on through this process, and even now, I, to, to, to say that I'm not suffering is not true. I still am, okay? I still have, you know, good days and bad. I still lean upon friends to, to buoy me up and to make things okay and, you know, tell me good things and support and sustain me, and I still need that and still lean upon it. But I, I have some direction in my mind, some goals that I've set to help me be a better person. That's what I want to be. I want to be better. I want to be better every day. And, you know, three months ago, I did feel that way. I felt like my, my life was pretty well over as far as productivity. But now I feel differently. And that's, and, you know, a number of people have, have, have helped me in, in crossing that bridge. But I'm crossing it. And I have a positive outlook. And, uh, and, you know, Justin's told me about you and your work and some of the things that you've done. And so, you know, I've met some pretty remarkable people, people that came out of that system that have been through what I've done. And look, what, look what's happened. Look mm -hmm. what's happened. Well, what you're, one of the things that you're doing right now is helping people who are going through similar circumstances before. They're having an opportunity to listen and learn and see that you were, were once in a, in a bad place, but yet you were started to recognize how you have a, a responsibility and a duty to become better, how you need to work to prove worthy of these people who love and support you and want to help you become better. And all of this is part of the healing process. It's part of the process of, of really expiating the, the bad decisions that we have made and start moving toward a better outcome. And I'm really glad that you've had an opportunity to meet Justin and to start um, climbing climbing your way out. When I was inside, I used to talk about I was building a ladder and, and every day I could take a, a positive step or build a new step towards the person that I wanted to become really empowered me. And I know that the people who love you are going to appreciate this effort that you're making to um, reconcile and become better. And I, I, I really applaud you for that, for that role that you're pursuing. How long has it been since you pleaded guilty, by the way? I pleaded guilty on the 27th of March. So, you know, it's been, um, you know, five or six weeks. I've been assigned to the Taft camp, which, uh, which was another big plus from uh, Justin because I had no idea <laughs> about prison camps and what to do. And so he gave me a lot of information regarding which camps were, in, my, in his opinion, the best. I did some research on my own. And so the judge, because there's no prison camp in Utah, or Idaho or the surrounding area, he asked me to give my recommendation and I recommended the prison camp at Taft and uh, that's where I was uh, sentenced to. So that was a huge deal on his part. I don't know what I would have done without having that kind of information. So I am gonna go to the Taft camp and I'm going to report here in about 10 days. Can you tell us a little bit about what the differences are, what makes Taft superior to other prison camps? Well, some of the things that I picked up on from Justin was the fact that, you know, <laughs> one of the things, the weather, although it, it's not great in Taft, okay, it's hot in the summers and it's fairly cold in the winters, but it doesn't have snow and rain, so you can go outside almost every day. Well, I think going outside's a big deal because you get fresh air, you're not cooped up in a building. So that was important to me. Taft, I used to live in the valley. I spent 21 years of my career just up the road in Tulare and Hanford. So it's close by for some friends as well. I think the fact that, uh, you know, it's a class two facility. I'm a type one diabetic. So I have some medical needs. And, you know, he indicated there's a clinic there that I can, uh, you know, get my insulin and have it done properly. He talked about the fact that, uh, you know, that I can learn there, that I'll have time to read, that I'll have time to write, have time to study, time to get better, and that there'll be some people there that I can help. Now, I can't help everyone there. It's obvious. 
But if I help one or two or five or whatever it is, that would be a positive step for me. He also indicated that he had other clients that were in Taft. It would be a big help to me when I get there. I'll have some kind of friends, some people to kind of tell me about what's going on. And so, you know, and, and he just assured me that I would be safe. When you first hear you're going to go to prison, safety is a big concern, <laughs> especially when you're a, a person like me. 63 years old, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, into conflict. And so safety was a big concern. And so, you know, his easing my pain regarding the safety was a big deal as well. I'm really glad to hear that. Now, you'd mentioned that you'd set some very clear goals that you wanted to achieve while you were in prison. Can you help our audience uh, understand what that means to set very clear goals and the types of goals that are going to be working for you? Okay, I kind of set my goals around three or four particular areas. First of all, uh, you know, fitness. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I weigh about 215 pounds. I should weigh about 160 pounds. So I've set a very specific goal that I want to lose 55 pounds. Okay, I want to be able, you know, I'm 63. When I come out, I'm 66. I need to be healthy when I come out. I need to be well, healthy. Wait a 66 when you get it. I thought your sentence was 36 months. Yeah, three years. 63 to 66. Okay, but you're going to get some good time and some halfway house off of that, aren't you? Yes, I will. So I'll probably be at Taft, according to what Justin says, about 26 months or something. Okay. Okay, okay. so continue with your goals. So besides, you know, I, I, I want to live a long time. So, you know, I'm going to get in good shape, lose weight. I want to be able to run. You know, I have a daughter who's a marathon gal. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to run marathons, but I want, to, I want to run a half marathon. Another thing is when I was in high school and college, I was fast. And I was a baseball player and football player. So I want to run the 100-yard dash again. I've challenged all my grandkids. Mm-hmm. Well, good for you. Good for you. Don't, you're going to make it through this, Scott, and you're going to be able to give your grandkids the – the, 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 uh, I guess it's the proof that even though an individual can fall, an individual can always pick himself back up and emerge stronger than when he went in and create value. And there's a, there's a positive message in that. And it's one that I'm sure your grandkids are going to carry for the rest of, your, rest of their lives. And in that sense, you can look at this as an opportunity, an opportunity to share your experiences, as, as you have said, and to help others reach their highest potential, um, help others do what you said you wish that you would have done, which is asked more questions, learned more about the process, learned earlier. But once you recognize that uh, you're you're going down this path, take action, take corrective action as you did. You reached out, you found a mentor, and it sounds like you really found a mentor. But how is it that you found Justin Paperni? I mean, that's kind of an unusual name. How, how do you just well, tell us, walk us through that process of how you found him and selected him? Well, you know, I, <laughs> I believe that fate had something to do with it. You know, I was looking through the internet. I looked at a number of different things and, and Justin uh, and you have this program about rehabilitation and getting your reputation back, reputation management. That struck me that I wanted to have a better reputation. How am I going to deal with that? So that was a that was a key word that I searched under. And then as I read this book, I was just impressed. That this isn't a guy that's just writing about it. He lived through it, you know, and you lived through it. And uh, that inspired me, okay? And so that's who I wanted to talk to. And the fact that he was available when I called was a huge deal for me. And that started this this ministry. Yeah, I'm so glad that you found that mentor. Could you give, uh, so in case there are others who may be listening to this that that might want to have that same type of guidance, how would they get in touch with Justin? Do you know? Well, yeah, you can go on under White Collar Advice or Prison Advisors, uh, either one, and just search for his name under the, in the internet under Justin Paperni. And uh, that's Justin. Justin McPerney with White Collar Advice or Federal Prison Advice. 
And I'm, I'm so glad that to have provided this opportunity, Scott, for you to, to talk about your journey and your experience. And I look forward to talking with you again on the other side of this journey where you can tell us how you have succeeded in losing 65 pa- 55 pounds <laughs> and how you have hundred yard dash and in how you have brought a sense of, of pride to all of the people who love you and respect you and want to see you overcome this challenge. We all as human beings face challenge in life and I'm really glad that you have found the uh, guidance to help you find that strength within and preparing. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and I do look forward to that, uh, that interview as well, and I think that you're going to find that I'm going to be a better man. Well, you're a great man right now for having the courage to, to uh, address an audience and tell an audience about what you've experienced. I'm going to give you the last word here as so we've come to the end of this Earning Freedom episode. Is there any final words that you'd like to say? And remember, you're sowing seeds right now for what I'm going to ask you about uh, in a couple of years when you come back home. Is there any final words that you'd like to share? Well, I guess my final words is that, uh, you know, we all have capabilities. We all make mistakes. but We all have the opportunity to make those right. <laughs> this is and a tough better. time right now. This is a tough time right now, but you're doing great, Scott, and you're going to do great. Thank you. Okay, I wish you the best and Godspeed as you work through this journey. And I look forward to hearing, hearing from you along the way. So make sure that you connect with me when you're at Taft through the email system and I can give an update to those who are, who are asking about you, all right? Okay, thank you very much.